I'm going to give you the punchline right up front, but I encourage you to watch all the way through uh, for all the evidence. It's going to rip the foundation out from under what I view as the key watchtower teaching. From the very start, Russell, C.T. Russell used the expression meat in due season from his pen, as he put it. And today, they, the uh, modern language translation of meat in due season would be food at the proper time, which no doubt, as being familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, you've heard that expression over and over and over, food at the proper time. And this implied that Matthew 24, 45 gave the Watchtower authority as a channel for spiritual food from God himself as a faithful and discreet slave. The Watchtower maintains to this day that Jesus came and inspected invisibly in 1919. And that when he came and inspected invisibly in 1919, he chose uh, those associated with the Watchtower as the faithful and discreet slave and channel. And they base this upon Malachi 3, 1 through 3. But when you read the Gospels, you'll see that this was applied to John the Baptist and Jesus as the two identified in this prophecy. And whether that would have another fulfillment uh, is up for one uh, to determine. But they're basing it upon Malachi 3, 1 through 3. Now, what if I can show you that in 1919, the food, the spiritual food, was inspired by demons? Would that knock the foundation out, the pillar out from under the Watchtower faithful and discreet slave authority? And today, in recent years, they changed the faithful and discreet slave from a more general group to specifically the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. These Currently, these eight men are the faithful and discreet slave providing food at the proper time. So now our story is going to center around this man you see here in this picture. This is Clayton J. Woodworth, pictured here. And if you look closely at the picture, you can see uh, there's C.T. Russell in the middle. And so he was, a, he was an early associate of Charles Taze Russell. Also, our story centers around uh, C.T., or I'm sorry, J.F. Rutherford here. They, these are the eight that were arrested, imprisoned in that um, 1918 uh, period. And so there's uh, Rutherford. And if you come down here, the third one from the right in height here, this is Clayton Woodworth, E.J. Woodworth. And the key to all of this that we're going to be talking about here. So we, uh, I might just add, so this, it's kind of ironic that there's a grade eight here, and now currently here, we have another grade eight. But anyways, the key to all of this is what was the spiritual food that if Jesus, as he allegedly came invisibly to do this inspection, what spiritual food would he have found at a 1919 inspection? The subject of our discussion is going to be largely around uh, this book, The Finished Mystery. Now, this, this was actually the only current book, the most recently released book, as it came out in 1917, that Jesus would have found if he came doing an invisible inspection of this Watchtower group as to whether they were uh, giving food at the proper time, meat, and due season. Now, the first six uh, volumes of this series, Studies in the Scriptures, originally called Millennial Dawn, were written by Charles Taze Russell, but now he had passed away in 1916. So these first six books were also still in print uh, for some time. But my point is this was the current, this was the new light, this was um, kind of a surprise presentation to the Bethel family. Uh, and this book, the first part of it, is on the book of Revelation. And then the second part is on the book of Ezekiel. We're going to really focus on the first part, which was written by Clayton Woodworth. And what if I can show you strong evidence that this book was inspired by demons? 
Now, keep in mind, the book claims throughout, throughout the book, it claims to be the truth from God. So if I can provide strong circumstantial evidence that this book was inspired by demons, what would that do to the foundation, which the Watchtower still holds to, that Jesus came in 1919 and inspected, and he's appointed this faithful and discreet slave. They still stand on that idea uh, to this day. Now, to begin with, I'm, I'm going to discuss an excerpt from this book, uh, Demonism and the Watchtower, which was, it's a compilation of um, various letters and tracts that, um, I don't have the man's name right here, but I'll get it for you in a minute. But anyways, he wrote because he was upset that he saw uh, different individuals at Bethel and pioneers and different ones were using this uh, radio clasped machine, which um, was very fringe medicine. And really, I think he demonstrated in the book that, well, that it, it's tied to the occult. It's, it's kind of like using a Ouija board <laughs> to uh, determine what your health problems and, and to uh, remedy uh, your health problems. So uh, let's go into and our foundation first will be a, a discussion of this excerpt from his book and then we're going to go back into the finished mystery and document some things there. Okay now this is a part two of a, a PDF I had made called the Cosmocrats of this darkness. Uh, Ephesians 6.12. And um, in this PDF, I have the excerpt that I want to discuss. So, so we'll go through uh, this excerpt from, uh, the man's name was Roy D. Goodrich. Roy D. Goodrich. And that, that book is readily available on, on Amazon today. Um, I usually finish everything <laughs> that I read, but I couldn't quite get through it because um, while there was valuable information in there, different letters he wrote and things to Bethel and different brothers were so long and so full of scriptures and I'm sure they were good and and he felt so strongly about what he was saying but it became very uh, tedious but that doesn't change the weight of what was in the book and its importance but anyways the book's available readily on Amazon but I, I've uh, put in my PDF here the excerpt directly from the book that I want to uh, discuss, and it's going to provide our foundation for what we're going to go in uh, after this. So, um, the following is taken from an old brochure written by the brochures in in the book, written by Roy Goodrich. He was a Bible student who tried to warn J. F. Rutherford and the Watchtower Society that the a silloclast and radioclast gadgets used by many high Bethel officials and rank and file members was demonic and worked through spirit mediumship. In his brochure number 272, Demonism and the Watchtower, which is where the title of the book is taken from, he made a connection between C.J. Woodward's admitted issues with demon possession, the Finnish Mystery Book of 1917, and Rutherford's frequent use of the silloclast and Rutherford's new light. So the excerpt uh, begins here. C.J., this is right directly from the book, this excerpt. C.J. Woodworth's Confession and Bold Prophecy. So I'm, I'm going to read this directly, and then as I do, I'll make some comments of my own at, at certain points. So here we go. It was our personal privilege to attend our second truth convention in the summer of 1913 at Asheville, North Carolina. Brothers Clayton J. Woodworth, Paul E. Thompson, J.D. Wright, William F. Hudgens, Ra uh, Raymond G. Jolly, and Pastor Russell himself were among the speakers whom we recall. Many of our old-time readers will no doubt recall that we are what we are about to relate. It was at that convention when Brother C.J. Woodworth, the man who was the continuous editor of the Golden Age from his first issue in 1919 to the last issue of Consolation in July 1946, and I just mentioned that's when it was changed then to Awake magazine, made a remarkable, never-to-be-forgotten speech. We vividly recall it. 
It was a confession publicly by Brother Woodworth to the effect that he had been very seriously under the control of the demons for some time, that under their influence he had written a book, contrary to the teachings of Pastor Russell, that his battle with these intelligences had been terrific, and that only by the greatest personal struggle had he, by the grace of God, been able to throw off their influence sufficiently to burn the manuscript which he had written, and thus turn aside from the eternal destruction toward which he confessed that these demons had been so rapidly uh, leading him. So I just might uh, make an aside here before I continue reading uh, from the book. Um, there was things related to this background information I have on this where Russell had made a, a vow which he wanted all the Bible students to take. And in that vow, part of the vow was that you would stay away from the occult, you know, from spiritism. And anyways, this vow became an issue for Brother Woodworth, D.J. Woodworth. And he actually wrote a 50-page letter to Russell explaining to Russell why scripturally he felt he couldn't agree to this vow that everybody was taking. Um, and so this was a great conflict for him. So he relates how he was, the demons, you know, he was under demon possession multiple times and he wrestled with the demons over and over again. But it was all over this vow because he felt scripturally that he couldn't take the vow. But yet Russell, the channel, the faithful of the street slave, wanted him to take this vow and he couldn't do it. But anyways, it was through wrestling with the demons and everything that he, it convinced him that he, he should humble himself and take this vow of Russell's. And see, it was during this time that he also, he wrote a book. He wrote, not only did he write the 50 page letter to Russell, but he also wrote this book that he said was contrary to the teachings of Pastor Russell. And so then after this battle with these intelligences, he burned the manuscript to the book. Now just keep that in mind because we're going to see how this all comes together. So I'm going to continue reading the excerpt from the book here. Four and one half short years later, the winter of 1916 and 1917, found this brother so recently and confessedly under demon control, feverishly and secretly writing the revelation portion of the seventh volume, the finished mystery, which was completed and released the following July. The society called it the posthumous work of Pastor Russell, which of course it was not. But our point here is this, on pages 126 and 127 of that volume, his own personal comments on Revelation 7-3, Brother Woodworth sets down the following. Evidently from his own personal experience, he has so graphically described at Asheville four and one half years uh, previously. Hey, brace yourself, folks. I'm going to read this in context later in this video, right, right from the book. But anyways, this is uh, from the book, The Demonism in the Watchtower, quoting from the finished mystery, pages 126 and 127. And there's quite a bit in between here, but this, this is directly from the book. It is evidently God's purpose soon to allow the minds of many of his little ones to become an open battleground upon which the fallen angels shall be judged. And the manner in which we meet the tests will prove our worthiness of crowns at the same time that it proves these disobedient spirits unworthy of life on any plane. This is something with which some, but not many, are yet familiar. But without experience, it is impossible to conceive the intensity of such struggles as Ephesians 6.12 suggests. The base of the brain is seized as in a vice. Interpretations of scripture, ingenious but misleading beyond description, are projected into the mind as water might be projected through a hose. The Finished Mystery, pages 126-127, underlining from Mr. Goodrich. Interpretations misleading beyond description projected into the mind as water through a hose. Continuing with the excerpt from Goodrich's book, whence these, 
It seems that it was shortly after Judge Rutherford contacted Dr. Abrams, Demonism in California. He's talking about that class, the radio class machines. And as he was preparing to import it into Bethel, that the following diverse and strange doctrines began to appear in the watchtower. The apostle warns, be not, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Hebrews 13, 9. We submit that the following, doc, following doctrines are very diverse from and very strange or foreign uh, to the Bible. So I'm going to read through these ones he has here, but there's much more to them, and I might comment on some of them from my own knowledge, as I've actually read all of Russell's books, all of Rutherford's books, and even books further past that, as well as many of the study articles that were appropriate and key to these time periods. So anyways, I've got quite a bit of background that really verifies what um, Mr. Goodrich points out here. So here's the the following doctrines that he, uh, Mr. Goodrich suspects come from another source than Jehovah God, but rather from channeling demons. Let's just be direct about that. Okay, number one, the Lord came to his temple for judgment in 1918. First voiced by J.F. Rutherford on September 8, 1922 at Cedar Point, Ohio. First published by the Watchtower of November 1st, 1922, page 324. Now it's interesting because we still hear about this 1922 Cedar Point, Ohio convention all the time in this theocratic history. And I'm going to make an aside on this here. The Lord came to his temple for judgment in 1918. This is talking about that. And they, they mentioned 1919 also. It's really hard to figure. They say 1918 to 1919, we'll say. So today, when the governing body mentions it, they usually say 1919. Because this has to do with that inspection, Malachi 3, 1 through 3. And I'm going to just point out here that I've been reading Rutherford's books. This really became a pillar of everything because his, his very authority, being the president of the Watchtower Society, and the voice, he basically became the very voice of Jehovah God. But he based it all on this 1918 invisible thing that happened. And um, so this is really like a key, a very key teaching that when we're thinking about something invisible on a channel and we're thinking from the invisible realm, you're going to have to nail down at some point, whether that is really from Jehovah God and his son, Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit, or whether it's from another invisible source. Anyway, let's continue with these teachings that Mr. Goodrich points out. Number two, the birth of the nation or kingdom of Christ was in 1914. First published in the Watchtower of March 1st, 1925. That may, may confuse some that aren't familiar with the history. See, Russell maintained from the beginning that Jesus Christ invisibly took up his kingdom power in 1874. And then see, 40 years later, 1914 was going to be the complete end of everything and the anointed would go home to heaven. So even after Russell died and Rutherford had taken over, they still maintained that Jesus had become invisibly king in 19, or, or I'm sorry, 1874. So it wasn't until 1925, with this Birth of the Nation article, that they switched it. They moved it up to 1914, as when Jesus came and came to power. Again, invisibly, you know, how do you prove invisible, right? So now, now we've got Jesus, parousia, and his coming to King of power in 1914. And it's interesting because, um, okay, let's go to number three, because this is where I'm going to comment as well. The editorial committee disappeared, and Jehovah became editor of the Watchtower, as of October 15th, 1931. You know, I've looked into that too in depth and actually read the study articles uh, related to it. And that's something you can you can go and look up. Um, I'm not sure, but it, October 15th, 1931, then might be the actual uh, Watchtower. These are available online. You can find PDFs to download um, of these study articles. But basically, I'll just say in my own words, what, what Rutherford did, there were ones on the... Everything had to go through an editorial committee, and then there had to be like a majority agreement before they would publish material in the Watchtower. But see, Rutherford, he was getting all the truth, you know, from the angels, he said. And 
So he didn't he didn't want an editorial committee to vet what he was going to have printed. And so basically what he did, he, he dissolved the editorial committee and he said, we don't need it anymore because we're being taught directly by Jehovah God. Like, in other words, he's getting the information straight from Jehovah. Because he's because Rutherford said that. The when Jesus came in kingdom power, which they said was 1914, and he started to separate the sheep and the goats. He says that Jesus came with his angels. So Rutherford said, in fact, he said, we no longer need the helper, the Holy Spirit any longer, because now we get taught or actually not we get taught, but Rutherford's getting the information. The Watchtower you know, is getting the information directly from the angels, he said. Well, think about that when you think about demonism channeling rutherford said this more than one time in the in the books i read and that's like another perhaps another video but i have all the documentation he said over and over again that he's getting the information directly from the angels he said they don't appear to him he doesn't see the angels but how it happens um is kind of a mystery but basically it's, it's directly from jehovah so you don't need an editorial committee any longer so again where <laughs> What source is this, this idea really coming from? Is it from Jehovah God and Jesus? Number four, Jehovah or Jehovah by Christ Jesus or the enthroned king then became and is now the sole leader, ruler, governor, commander, and or teacher of those who read and obey the instructions of the last tower society. And see, that's what I'm talking about. If you to understand what he's saying here, if you read all of Rutherford's books and you read the study articles back during Rutherford's lifetime, and go in order, you'll see exactly what he's saying here. Basically, Rutherford took all these authorities, Jehovah, Jehovah and Jesus, but basically he was there. Rutherford himself became the very voice of God, the very face of God. And so whatever he said was directly from Jehovah, even though they wouldn't admit that in, in practice, that's exactly what he was saying, that it was all coming directly, directly to them. Number five. All instructions and commandments issuing from the Watchtower office are not the commandments of men, but the commandments of God's organization. And to question, oppose, or disobey these is to question, oppose, and disobey God. And that, yes, this is page after page after page in Rutherford's books. He says it. He says we must obey God and do his work, his way, the way he commands. And what that means is um, they start to report your time um, and get out and sell Rutherford's books. And if you don't do it that way, then you, you know, you're know you you're about to be an evil slave. And so everything that Rutherford wanted done was a commandment and instruction issuing directly from Jehovah God. It was coming from the Watchtower organization. It was coming from Jehovah God. So to question any direction was to question God. And I'm just gonna make an aside here as can be seen in my other videos, this whole um, last two and a half years of this uh, event, uh, the course that the governing body has taken um, is clearly they're saying that, you know, that Jehovah God is the one that wants you to take the thing. And, um, you know, anyways, that, that's covered well in my other videos. Number six, those who judge, beat, and excommunicate those who disagree with the above diverse and strange wise tower doctrines are the faithful and wise servant of Matthew 24, 45. And those who are thus beaten, judged, that communicated and hated are the evil servant of Matthew 24, 48. Yeah, back then they, they, they hadn't changed this understanding of the evil servant. Now they say the evil servant part of Jesus uh, parable, that's just a parable. But they still maintain that the first part of it, Matthew 24, 45, the faithful and wise servant, that's a prophecy, you know, that upon which gives them their appointment, it's not just a parable. But many have covered that well, that biblically, Jesus was just giving a parable about being awake and being a good servant. He didn't say he was going to appoint a class of individuals that would basically rule over his people. And we see the same pattern today. The beating uh, being done to those that question any of this direction. If they if they don't, if they start to wonder, maybe this isn't from Jehovah God. Uh, now you're in trouble. Questions that he asks: Is there not an obvious relationship of cause and effect between Judge Rutherford's contacts with the Abrams demonism, 
in California after his release from prison in the greatly weakened bodily condition in 1919, and the projection into his mind later on the above diverse and strange doctrines, ingenious but misleading beyond description. Could Judge Rutherford's uncompromising stand for the Abrams demonism and therapy assure him or us of God's protection of him from the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or demons? Is there any assurance that those with whom Judge Rutherford surrounded himself and who now have charge of the society are free from demon influence? Since the diagnostic machine of Dr. Albert Abrams at Jonesboro, Arkansas, in the radio class, its present counterpart, so long housed and used at the Bethel home, are both ideal for receiving yes and no answers from the occult realm, have we any assurance that these have not been so used in the formulation of Watchtower doctrines, policies, and commandments? Could the above mentioned and other Diverse and strange Watchtower doctrines have thus been projected into the mind of Watchtower leaders as water might be projected through a hose. Are they not ingenious and misleading beyond description? Here's a few questions I asked myself when I made this PDF. Today, November 10th, 2022, I was also asking myself if, if the Watchtower under Rutherford and him personally was using a quack device that was akin to a Ouija board for healing, is it really an anomaly that the governing body pushed and mandated a healing concoction from pharmacia comprised of genetic altering mRNA, quantum dots, nanobots, graphene, and luciferase? Today, the governing body still claims that Jesus came and inspected the Watchtower in 1918-1919 and found them providing meat in due season that Jesus approved. The only book released at that time was the 1917 The Finished Mystery, which was a book written by a man who admitted to writing a book under direct demonic possession. That's the one he, he burned. <laughs> and anyone who reads this book quickly sees that it is a book of madness. That is The Finished Mystery. The worst book I ever read by a huge margin. Yeah. So I mentioned I greatly, I fear greatly for the sheep still under the Watchtower spell. Okay, I have a, a PDF here, a, a 1918 edition of The Finished Mystery, which was first uh, published in 1917. And we're going to take some time and just go through some excerpts from the book. As I mentioned, the book is just incredible. It, it really is, the, is. Honestly, it's the very worst book I have ever read on the Bible in my entire life. It, it, it's just just incredible. But I'm going to take a few light, highlights out of the book because I need to make the connection for you that we've been leading up to here and that Goodrich, Mr. Goodrich touched on about this book written by C.J. Woodworth. Uh, we're focusing not on the Ezekiel part, but the first part on Revelation. Well, let's go in and take some excerpts from it. So let's uh, scroll here, the finished mystery. Just a side point, this this thing here, you can you should look into because this is, I don't, you know, what is it doing on a Bible-based book, right? See these little things here, these are serpents. And this is a, a well-known Egyptian thing with a whole lot of background that you can go into, but it's it's very heavy in the occult, and it's right on the, it's right on the cover of the book, you know, a helping hand for Bible students. Like, what is this? Anyways, we're going to let that go. We don't have time to talk about that today. Okay, studies in the scriptures, volume seven, the finished mystery, nineteen eighteen. He mentioned it's the posthumous work of Pastor Russell. And really the only basis for that is that they do take a lot of quotes out of the Watchtower that Ru of Russell's comments on various verses of Revelation. But really the book is, uh, I think it's out of that fire hose into C.J. Woodward's skull. But anyways, so I'm just going to scroll down here and read the first paragraph in the book, here's the contents, just to set the stage, and then we're going to just cover a number of other uh, excerpts. So we're almost there. Uh, okay. I'll enlarge this for the other excerpts, but right out of the gate, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
John the Revelator and the prophet Habakkuk have foretold that the understanding of this revelation given in 96 AD is set for an appointed time, the end of the age, and that at this time, now, when the predicted faithful and wise servant would be present with God's people, the vision would be made plain. We have it right out of the gate here, and you'll see as you go through the book. He's basically saying that this interpretation of revelation given in this book, because it's the due time, which is now, and the prophets foretold it for our day, that now the vision is it, it would be made plain. So everything in this book is put forth as basically inspired from God because now the due time has arrived. And that was also the MO of Rutherford. He said it over and over and over again that basically he says, since the due time has arrived, we understand everything in the Bible. Nobody could understand it till today, but now we all understand it completely and perfectly, basically was the implication because now we're at the time of the end. And so it was foretold we would understand everything. And so everything I'm telling you is J.F. Rutherford is now uh, unquestioned truth because the due time is here. So anyways, just the foundation right out of the gate. The vision is made plain. Now, as we go through these excerpts from the book, um, you could be asking yourself, does this seem like it's coming from Jehovah God and Christ Jesus through this channel? Or is it coming from a different invisible entity through a channel. Just think about that as we go through this book in the background that we've already discussed. There is page 93. He's discussing the prophet Nahum, and he says that Nahum, he describes a railway train in motion, not an automobile or something. And then he goes on to uh, describe this train in great detail, breaking down all the verses word by word. It says, next the prophet takes his place in the train and looks out of the window. So he's got Nahum hopping in the train and looking out the window. And it goes on and on in, in just great detail. But that's something you can read and look into uh, if you'd like. Now, as I go through this, I'm not just going through and, and taking all the low-hanging fruit. I mean, the whole book is like the excerpts I'm taking. But anyways... His commentary on Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, another angel. This this is, whenever he has this part, that's, that's taken directly from the verse in the Bible. He breaks it down sometimes word by word, expression by expression. So, and another angel. Not the voice of the Lord mentioned in the preceding chapter, but the corporate body, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which Pastor Russell formed to finish his work. This verse shows that Though Pastor Russell has passed beyond the veil, he is still managing every feature of the harvest work. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the greatest corporation in the world because from the time of its organization until now, the Lord has used it as his channel through which to make known the glad tidings. So now, this is before we have Rutherford getting it from the angels. We've got Pastor Russell now in heaven, and he's somehow channeling still being a channel from the invisible realms uh, to the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. Yep. And continuing, chapter 8, verse 5 of Revelation, and the angel, the Watchtower Society, through its proper representatives. So now they're an angel in Revelation. He's, <laughs> this corporation and, and, and the, the men on the earth are are this angel in Revelation. They took the censer, the censer, again, quoting directly from Revelation, the, the angel, the Watchtower Society, took the censer, the censer is what? The seventh volume of studies in the scriptures divinely provided. So that's, that's the very book that you're reading here. Amazing. It's it, This book is in the book of Revelation as a censer and filled it with fire of the altar. Coals from the altar signify burning truths. And such the Lord's prophecies always are, which rightly understood. This is a plain intimation of God's purpose to use the society in further unfoldings of his truth as it becomes due. Now we're up to Revelation chapter 10 and verse 3. And cried with a loud voice, 
Pastor Russell was the voice you need. And when? In 1881. He had cried, again, this is quoting right from the Bible, he had cried, with the first great cry, food for thinking Christians, 1,400,000 copies given away free, seven thunders, he cries, seven thunders, seven volumes of studies in the scriptures. So again, this book that you are now reading here is part of the Revelation, the book of Revelation. Okay, page 182, Revelation 11, 19, the ark. The ark was seen in heaven. The ark is the repository of the sacred and hidden things of Revelation and Ezekiel. Of his, the testament of God, the secret, the finished mystery. So basically he's saying the ark and the testament seen in heaven is um, this book, The Finished Mystery. There's a commentary on Revelation and Ezekiel from Jehovah. And if you are ever wondering about the 12th chapter of Revelation, if you are ever wondering who Michael and his angels are that battle with the dragon, well, Michael means who is God? It's the Pope. Michael is the Pope and so who are Michael's angels that battle with the dragon? Michael and his angels, the angels are the bishops. And you may wonder then who the dragon is, the great original serpent called the devil and Satan that's cast down to the earth. Well, that great dragon is none other than Imperial Rome. So there you have that. I'm not unjustly being harsh here. I'm not the one who claimed to be a voice of God, the very voice of God, you know, giving meat in due season and food at the proper time. So anyways, back in the book of Revelation here, chapter 14, verse 15, and another angel, the witness to the Lord in the land of Egypt, Isaiah 19, verse 20. See pages 309, 311 of volume three of the studies in the scriptures and observe that chapter 10 of volume three scripture studies is in reality a separate book. He's talking about C.T. Russell's book. Because within this book, he's got a he's got a chapter that is 66 pages long about the Great Pyramid of Giza, how it it confirms all the chronology in the Bible, and that basically Jehovah had the had the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza built. So it came out of his temple, crying with a loud voice, through the 66 pages of his testimony. To him that sat in the cloud, on the cloud, to our present Lord, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. The Great Pyramid confirms the Bible's teachings that the time of the harvest has come. We're just warming up here. Uh, Revelation 14, 20, and the wine press. What's the wine press? the seventh volume of scripture studies, the work that will squeeze the juice out of the abominations of the earth. So in other words, this book, again, this book you're reading is the wine press of Revelation 14, 20, in case you never knew that, was trodden without the city. You may wonder what the city is. What city more appropriate to refer to than the Bethel? the divinely appointed center for the harvest work, the embryo kingdom of God on earth, I'm talking about Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bethel, came out of the wine press, the exposition of the prophecies of Ezekiel and the Re Revelator. Coming out of the wine press. Okay, you may recall in the book of Revelation that the blood of the trampled wine press, the blood it mentions about a space of a thousand six two hundred furlongs, and that is the distance from the um, C. J. Woodworth and the other um, brother that wrote the Ezekiel portion. They both were living in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and during 1916, when they were writing this this book, they lived blocks apart from each other so 
anyways, um, this distance here mentioned in the book of Revelation is calculated for us here. The work on this volume was done in Scranton, Pennsylvania. As fast as it was completed, it was sent to the Bethel. Half of the work was done at an average distance of five blocks from the Lackawanna station, and the other half at a distance of 25 blocks, because it was the two different brothers writing the book. Blocks in Scranton are 10 to the mile, hence the average distance to the station is 15 blocks, or, or 1.5 miles. The mileage from Scranton to Hoboken Terminal is shown in timetables as 143.8, and this is the mileage charged to passengers. But in 1911, at an expense of $12 million, the Lackawanna Railroad completed its famous cutoff, saving 11 miles of the distance. From the day the cutoff was completed, the trainmen have been allowed 11 miles less than the timetable shows, or a net distance of 132.8 miles. Hoboken Ferry to Barclay Street Ferry, New York is 2 miles. Barclay Street Ferry to Fulton Ferry, New York is 4,800 feet or 0.9 miles. Fulton Ferry, New York to Fulton Ferry, Brooklyn is 2,000 feet or 0.4 miles. And Fulton Ferry, Brooklyn to Bethel is 1,485 feet or 0.3 miles. So the shortest distance from place where the wine press was trodden by the feet members of the Lord, whose guidance and help alone made this volume possible, is a, it's 137.9 miles. So there you have it. That's the that's right here in the book of Revelation. The space of 1,600 for long. And now we're up to Revelation chapter 15, verse 5. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Pastor Russell was given a clear, beautiful, complete comprehension of the plan of God as revealed in the tabernacle arrangements and sacrifices. This is the foundation of all his work. Revelation 15, 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple. The seven volumes of scripture studies emerged, all in harmony with the teachings of the tabernacle from which they proceeded. Okay, so we're up to the 18th chapter of Revelation and verse 1 of this angel. I saw another angel came down from heaven and the earth was lighted up with his glory. Some of the glories of the new day all discovered since 1874 are adding machines, aeroplanes, aluminum, antiseptic surgery, artificial dyes, automobile couplers, automobiles, barbed wire, bicycles, carborundum, cash registers, celluloid, correspondence schools, cream separators, darkest Africa, disc plows, divine plan of the ages, oh boy, uh, dynamite, electric railways, electric welding, escalators, fireplace cookers, gas engines, harvesting machines, model types, motion pictures, uh, North Pole, Panama, Canal, pasteurization, railway signals, road pigeon rays, shoe sewing machines, smokeless powder, South Pole, submarines, radium, skyscrapers, subways, talking machines, telephones, typewriters, vacuum cleaners, and wireless telegraphy. 18 verse 2, and he cried mightily with a strong, mighty voice. How apt are these scriptures that refer to Pastor Russell as a voice. Okay, Revelation 18 4, and I heard another voice from heaven, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the corporate body which Pastor Russell personally organized to conduct the harvest work. This voice has been exerted continuously since 1884. We have Revelation 19.11, and I saw heaven opened. The hidden things of God as recorded in the seventh volume of studies in the scriptures. So we see this volume that you're now reading here. Basically, seems like much of the book of Revelation was written in relation to the studies in the scriptures, volume 7. And we have... 1915, and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. Now remember, this is chapter 19. This is the famous famous vision where Jesus comes with the heavenly armies in heaven. So Jesus, and out of his mouth go, goeth the sharp sword. That's the context here. And 
he, that is Jesus, he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the anger of Almighty God. The Lord assumes in an interest in and responsibility for the complete series of studies in the scriptures, the last one of which especially represents the winepress feature. So somehow we have Jesus coming with his heavenly armies, treading the winepress of God's anger, and somehow it's Jesus assuming responsibility Think about this. I, we got to wait here for just a second because we're thinking about okay, demonic influence channeling. We'll stop and push pause here for a minute and let this sink in. The Lord assumes an interest in and responsibility for the complete series of studies in the scriptures, the last one of which especially represents the wine press feature. So, the book, The Finished Mystery, that we're reading here and the whole studies in the scriptures from Russell, this is somehow Jesus coming with his heavenly armies to tread the winepress of the anger of God's wrath. And somehow this comes to mean that Jesus is assuming interest in and responsibility for. So now the responsibility for all these seven books in this last book is placed at the feet of our Lord Christ Jesus, somehow. I won't even take the time to find the context of this one, but I just thought it was interesting. Page 310, these ancient worthies will come forth from the tomb perfect, but during the entire millennium, they will be amidst imperfect surroundings. A part of the evidence that the ancient worthies will be made sharers of the spirit nature and become members of the great company class. Anyways, the great company, at that time, the great crowd was considered a secondary heavenly class. And the ancient worthies were, you know, Abraham and all those ones before Christ that lived. So apparently they're coming back perfect. And they're also spirit, sharing in the spiritual nature somehow. Okay, this is my last <laughs> excerpt from the book and really my very favorite. In fact, it was the one part of the book that gave me a good laugh. I just had to laugh out loud at the irony here. So we come to Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. To all who ever understand it, is his comment. If any man shall add unto these things, as was done in many instances during the Dark Ages, even in this very verse, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. What will the penalty be if you add or take a, if you add or take away from the book of Revelation? What will your penalty be? His penalty will be when he comes forth from the tomb in the times of restitution that he will have to read the seven volumes of scripture studies and get the matter straightened out in his own mind. So if you add or take away from the book of Revelation and you're going to have the privilege to live during the thousand year reign of Christ during the millennium, the times of restitution, your penalty for adding or taking away from the book of Revelation is going to be you're going to have to read and study the seven volumes of the scripture studies, including this marvelous book, and get the matter straightened out in your own mind. And I thought Jehovah's Witnesses didn't believe in eternal torment. Now, I did skip over Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7 because I had promised you that excerpt from Goodrich's book that I would, I would come back and consider and read the actual whole excerpt here because really this is a foundation for this whole video being made. So, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7 Somehow, I don't know, but nor the trees is part of the verse there. But here, here's what he says. Have you enjoyed this work thus far? Are you convinced it is of the Lord, prepared under his guidance? Have you carefully and prayerfully read the comments on Revelation 7, 1? Then brace yourself for the truth that is evidently God's purpose soon to allow the minds of many of his little ones to become an open battleground 
upon which the fallen angels shall be judged. And the manner in which we meet the test will prove our worthiness of crowns at the same time that it proves these disobedient spirits unworthy of life on any plane. This is something with which some but not many are yet familiar. Truly, on aside here, he's, he's talking about, he's familiar with this battleground in the mind with the demons because he was in his hotel rooms and various places battling with demon possession for many, many weeks, I think it was, many days. He battled with demon possession, literal demon possession. T.J. Woodworth battled with demon possession. So what he's saying is here, this is something, this battle for the minds of, of the little ones is something with which some but not many are yet familiar. So some are familiar. So like he's really privileged because he's had this battle of demon possession, okay? And so that's what he's talking about here. Just to, just I had to do that little aside to, in case you're missing what he's saying. Truly we know the apostle in writing of this evil day says, we wrestle not against blood and flesh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wicked ones in heavenly places. Truly we know the Lord Jesus at the first advent began his ministry with 40 days of conflict with the adversary who all that time sought to sway his mind. Truly we have reason to believe we must have had, truly we have reason to believe he must have had other terrible battles when he spent all night in prayer and especially when he was so depressed in the garden of Gethsemane. So he's, I gotta stop again here. So he's saying Jesus was having battles with with Satan and the demons like um, like, like he had, like C.J. Woodworth had, like where they're possessing him. He's, he's getting demon possessed. So like Jesus battled with the demons like he was being possessed. And apparently this happened when he spent the whole night in prayer to his father, Jehovah God. He was battling with the demons. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying to his father, Jehovah God, he was also battling with the, with the demons, okay? Oh my goodness. But without actual experience, it is quite impossible to conceive of the intensity of such struggles as Ephesians 6.12 suggests. So now he's talking, now again, he's talking from personal experience. He says the base of the brain is seized as in a vice. Interpretations of scripture, ingenious but misleading beyond description, are projected into the mind as water might be projected through a hose. You know, how many times have you heard the Watchtower use the expression channel? The channel? Things are projected into the mind as water might be projected through a hose. Visions may be tried. Wonderful illuminations of the mind as by a soft but glorious greenish or yellow haze. Sedu sedu seductive suggestions may be made based on circumstances of the environment. Offers of inspiration may be made. The privilege of sleep may be taken away for days at a stretch. So C.J. Woodworth went for days without sleep, being battling with the demons. All this is with the object of forcing the unfortunate into at least temporary insanity so as to destroy his influence and, if possible, his faith in God. Failing in all other attempts, the mind may be flooded with the thoughts that are vile beyond description. So this all happened, C.J. Woodworth is saying this is what happened to him. All this under demon possession. He says, then remember the vow. So the vow that, you know, Russell's vow, and part of that vow was to stay away from uh, the occult, right? Okay. So anyways, um, yeah, at this point, just to take a breath of fresh air uh, out from all this darkness before I run the final um, clip of this video, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this is really very it's refreshing and stark contrast to what we've been considering here. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And so I don't want anybody to misconstrue from my videos, even as the evidence I bring out 
will destroy people's faith in the Watchtower, if they're honest, it'll destroy their faith in the Watchtower organization and movement, really, from its inception. But what happens with people, they sometimes as their faith crumbles in this organization and in men, they lose all faith. And that's not my object or goal here. I have no intention of helping anybody to turn to atheism and opposition against God and the Bible. That's not where I'm coming from at all. You know, others have made that, that choice, but that's not where I'm coming from. So I don't, I don't mean to just attack the Watchtower and destroy its credibility and then destroy someone's faith. This isn't meant to stumble. It's meant to, it is meant to stumble you from the Watchtower, but Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to Jehovah God except through Jesus. So it's, it's with that in mind that I've said all these things and that I'm going to run uh, this, this final clip here. From here, I'm not going to review or sum up or try to tell you what, what conclusions you should make from what you've seen, but I'm just going to ask you to contrast the information that you've just seen with what Stephen Lett says in this September 2022 monthly broadcast. So this is just a very uh, recent one. So uh, brother uh, Stephen Lett gets to do the outro. Take it away, brother Lett. Please ask yourself, as one of Jehovah's figurative sheep, do I obediently respond to the voice of the fine shepherd and flee from the voice of strangers? Well, let's talk about this. The original stranger was Satan the devil. Like a ventriloquist, he made a serpent appear to talk. But the words were Satan's words. Satan thereby used his voice to slander Jehovah and deceive Eve. Today, Satan continues his work as an evil ventriloquist using not serpents, but human puppets to enunciate his voice, these acting as his agents, either wittingly or unwittingly. But now, let's discuss three examples of how our fine shepherd tells us one thing but Satan's underlings or strangers tell us something opposite. We must be vigilant to listen to the right voice. Our fine shepherd tells us as our first example, these words at Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time. Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. We know the master Jesus found the faithful and discreet slave spiritually feeding right-hearted ones in 1919 and at a future time will appoint him over all his belongings. So what's the implication? Obviously, even now, Jesus fully trusts the faithful slave. And all of us, even individual members of the governing body, should do the same. 